Welcome, welcome, welcome to Proles of the Round Table. Round table. Round table. Hello and welcome to Proles of the Round Table, where we sit down, have a few beers, and talk leftist history. Please do us a favor and subscribe on your favorite podcast app and rate a review to help extend our reach. Before we get started, we wanted to thank our sponsor, without whom we wouldn't have these nice microphones. So thanks to our sponsor, Confucius. We really appreciate your, <laughs> your uh, support. we got two new microphones today, so <laughs> it's, it's a real Confucius one. spares no expenses. Right, yeah. So we have a special guest tonight. Um, we have Brett O'Shea from the Revolutionary Left Podcast. What you drinking, Brett? Hey, what's up, guys? I am drinking um, two things, actually. Yo! Um, <laughs> Double fist <dude. laughs> I just grabbed shit in my fridge, so He's I have Dogfish Head, um, Sea Quench Ale, the Session Sour, and Deschutes uh, Fresh Squeezed IPA. Ah, so I'm sours. How about you guys? So uh, we're also here with Ezra, Justin, Ethan, and me, 8-Hop. Uh, Ezra, what are you drinking tonight? <laughs> I'm just drinking water with lemon in a mug as oh, well. Oh, with lemon? <laughs> oh. We're keeping up the tradition Risque with diffused Kimball, water. Lisa. <laughs> not getting too turned tonight. No. no, no. Uh, I'm drinking Penner again because I'm too broke to buy anymore. Um, I'm drinking uh, Miller High Life, which is actually the champagne of beers. Uh, I mean, I feel like every time I come on here, I have to drink. I don't trust you. Anymore. I have to drink. Shit. It says right here. No, I have. When I like, that's my main. In the that's party. my main purpose of being here is to like represent the shitty beer. So that we appreciate the work you do for us. Yeah, <laughs> You're welcome for the yeah. service. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm drinking Ballast Points Sour Wench, which is like anything Ballast Point just never disappoints. It's so good, yeah, it really is for sure. Yeah, it's great. So tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, Cultural Revolution in China. Um, Brett is our subject matter expert here. So Brett, I'll kick it to you and let you. Uh, Start off wherever you like. Yeah, definitely. Why don't we go with your sort of explanation of the background situation, the Great Leap Forward, etc., and then that that'll bleed easily into to my starting point for the the Great Proletarian uh, Cultural Revolution. Okay. Um, well, yeah. And so what we're not going to do is give a whole bunch of context for um, the revolution in China because that's there's a lot Another there. Episode, right? um, and if you're if you're looking for an introduction to that, I mean, Brett. Brett has an episode of his podcast like a month ago that was pretty good on that, so you can go listen it's to that. It's hard to come up with a topic that Brett hasn't done. Well, right. Exactly. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I'll talk specifically about uh, the Great Leap Forward for a couple minutes, um, which was just a, a couple years before the proletarian revolution. It was started in late 1957, and basically it was a massive program to develop the economic forces of China, because still at this point, um, they weren't they didn't have the infrastructure um, for to keep up with like the Soviet Union or uh, the U.S. or to like yeah they must construct additional pylons. They had to construct additional like productive forces, um, and so so Mao Mao and a few Mao. other Mao uh, <laughs> Mao and a few other um, party members had this idea like it was uh, yeah they, was, they called it. A great leap forward, and they were going to. Um, it was going to be a just in several years. Everyone's going to buckle down, and they were going to do incredible things. They're going to like build more, build faster, and make China um, great again. I guess it's a better name than the Ukrainian famine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's objective. Uh, basically, what this what this was, um, it, was it was yeah, it was a program of increased production. And so um, one of the things that happened right after the revolution was uh, land re- redistribution, where it was um, like land was appropriated and uh, distributed to the peasants. And but during the Great Leap Forward, um, they started taking some of these collective farms that had also sprung up in the uh, years after the revolution, and then giving more and more power to these collective farms and creating these communes, um, these, these large, um, yeah, collective organizations where people would live in these communal structures, do work on these communal farms, and uh, spend less and less time on their own individual plots. Uh, and um, 
yeah, and so the whole goal of that was to increase efficiency, increase production, because, I mean, even at this point, the population of China was like at least half a billion. I'm not, I don't, I don't remember the exact number. Brett, do you remember? I don't know the exact numbers at that time, but it was definitely getting, getting up there towards a billion. For right, sure. yeah. So it was just truly incredible numbers of people. But, um, yeah, so, uh, so people's private plots of land were communalized, um, which later on Mao actually criticized, saying that um, even during the revolution, they had, when they took the land of the capitalists, they, gave, they reimbursed them for it. And then these communes were not doing that. And so he's like this is banditry we need to like we shouldn't we shouldn't have gone we got a little carried away guys um and there was also mao specifically uh recommended this policy of um basically backyard steel furnaces not like what? in everybody's back well like so like your commune they would be like you'd get a he's like build a build a steel furnace and people would just be like throwing metal shit in there and just like melting it all down trying to make steel like girders and like building materials um and people were doing a lot of that with a lot of subpar materials and not a ton of people knew what they were doing. So it, they were, were turning out this really shitty steel um, that broke a lot because it wasn't actually steel. It was something called pig iron, which like you need to do something else to make it steel. Um, but yeah, so that, it shifted away a lot of time and energy that they could have spent on growing food. And so when people talk about um, how Mao killed... 800 gorillion, gorillion people or whatever. Um, <laughs> it usually is um, talked about in the context of during the Great Leap Forward because what happened in like 1959 was there was, uh, they started to have a really bad growing year, like a really bad famine. There were droughts, there were floods. Um, I want to point out real quick, like how okay the general population seems to be with like, um, like biblical biblical mass exterminations of humans like like stories like noah's ark but as soon as like a communist does it it's like all of a sudden <laughs> so god can do it but yeah. how can't yeah. okay. um, no, but... it's like oh yeah yeah like everybody on the earth drowning that's fine like that's that's a sign of like a good god but then like yikes but it, well but and it was um like in 1959, I read that 40% of all the tilled land in China suffered some sort of natural disaster. And you have to look at, like, throughout the history of China, there were a long, there, like, there, there was a regular history of famines and droughts and floods and natural disasters. And um, this one, like, natural, like, it was, it was an act of God, quote unquote. But, um, like, definitely it did make things a little worse that they had these kind of, um, these communes that were not really responding to very much central planning. Everyone was just kind of going wild. Um, yeah. Uh, and so part of the problem with the Great Leap Forward is that Khrushchev, um, this is a whole other episode with like the Sino-Soviet split, um, but in 1960, Khrushchev recalled uh, 1,400 Soviet scientists and industrial specialists, with all, and with all their machine blueprints, he told them to take them back home. He brought them back to... Uh, yeah, he, he told them to come back to the Soviet Union because uh, apparently they weren't being treated well, but really it was just, it was a power play. Ugh. He was like, because China had been criticizing um, Khrushchev, calling him a, a revisionist, and he was like, well, fuck you. He was. So, yeah, valid, valid <laughs> and, and the USSR, um, they asked China to pay up all their war debts um, from the war. They were like, hey, yeah, pay up. We're not going to, we're not doing this anymore. So then... China mostly paid that in grain. So another part of the problem is that they were exporting huge amounts of grain to the Soviet Union so they could pay up their war debt so they wouldn't be in debt to these people that they considered, like, revisionist assholes. Um, True. Yeah. Uh, there were, there, I mean, there were some good things that happened. Um, they built a ton of, like, dams and reservoirs, ir irrigation systems, flood control systems. They planted a lot of trees. They built some railroads. Um, and even with the shitty pig iron si situation... They did set up in in some places. There were some iron mining and smelting systems that like still work. That they're still, like I said, the infrastructure for that. So it wasn't all bad, but uh, it was definitely um, they just. I think folks got a little carried away. Okay. So that's yeah. So I guess that's a little preface. Um, so now Brett can take it away. 
Yeah, I think that's an, that's important to point out, and I'll kind of return to this in a second, but another aspect of the Great Leap Forward that people should try to understand is that it was an attempt to industrialize a largely you know backward, underdeveloped country, and there were mistakes made, but the intention, the intentions from Mao and the, and the communist government in China were pure. I mean, it was to industrialize the country and move the country towards modernization. Um, the policy, coupled with some you know natural disasters, it, it did add up to to have some catastrophic effects, but you know it, it was a sincere, serious policy proposal to rapidly industrialize the entire country. And this is a huge country, so you should think about that through the, throughout this entire discussion. We're talking 500 to 900 million people, much bigger than the U.S. is even today. So to try to get everybody on the same page, it was a massive feat. And any successes as well as failures should be considered inside of that interpretive lens. But another Another thing about the Great Leap Forward that also applies to the Cultural Revolution was that Mao was very, very in, uh, into the idea of it can't just be a top-down revolution. You can't just take power and then, you know, command from on high, but rather that you have to give the, the working people, the peasants, the students agency. You have to teach them through revolutionary experience. You know, this, this long-held Mao line that knowledge comes through work, through actually, you know, putting your feet on the ground and doing the thing. You know, knowledge is a byproduct of, of that. You can't just sit back in an armchair and think through the world's problems. You have to actually get involved with them. And so in both the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, as you'll see, this huge attempt to put agency and revolutionary responsibility into the hands of the people was a theme that Mao came back to again and again. So let's just go ahead and just a basic fact, a temporal fact about the Cultural Revolution. It was from 1966 to 1976 when Mao died, um, though its primary years and most intense years, when people, a lot of people who are sort of like, you know, just sort of elementarily um, informed about the Cultural Revolution. It really happened in the first two years. A lot of the, if you know anything about the Cultural Revolution, a lot of the images that will appear in your mind when you think about it are really from 66 and 68. But the Cultural Revolution did did extend beyond that in just a more moderate form. And we'll get to all that throughout the talk, obviously. But I do want to start with some reasons for the uh, Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution there were many reasons. Um, one of the reasons that Mao had was he wanted to unleash the masses on the party itself. He, as I said, he wanted to put agency and revolutionary responsibility into the hands of regular working people. Mao really did believe that people should steer the revolution, the masses should steer the revolution, and not rely solely on authority figures to tell them what to do. He also wanted to purge the country and the party of anti-communist ideological remnants. There were still bourgeois and traditional elements inside the communist party and inside the country as a whole that Mao really feared would undermine the progress of revolution. And Mao also really believed that a revolution needed not only happen in the base of a society, but also in the superstructure. So the Cultural Revolution was this huge, you know, experiment in the history of the socialist project of having a revolution in the superstructure itself, which is a fascinating idea. And many Maoists today believe that, you know, if, if we get a chance before the earth is destroyed, if we get a chance to have another big socialist revolution, we have to realize that, that a revolution in the base in and of itself is not necessarily always enough. I mean, just to, to parse this idea out, imagine in the U S after centuries of white supremacy, colonialism, imperialism, Socialists somehow have a revolution and we start, you know, mingling with the base, the productive forces of society. There is still that ideology in the heads of every single person who was educated in this society that needs to be revolted against and fixed. And, and, and we, we don't always have time to just educate it out of people through multiple generations. So this sort of revolution in the superstructure was a, was a big point in this. Um, also, Mao believed that class struggle continues and is in fact intensified under socialism, this transitionary stage between capitalism and communism. A lot of the contradictions and the class struggles will come to the fore and that, you know, we, we need to keep that in mind when we're going forward. Mao and, is a, so Mao is a Trotskyist? Oh, I, I would not say that. <laughs> Mao, Mao would not like you saying that. <laughs> Apologies, Mao, Mao. Mao was a principal Marxist-Leninist. <laughs> well, no, absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, so, like, anti-revisionist Marxist-Leninist. I'm curious how uh, class conflict increases under socialism. Um, it, I think a lot of it was that 
people become complacent when you have the socialist transitionary period, when you have a communist government in control. People tend to think that the situation, like the, the worst of the capitalists have been defeated. But as we know, it's a transitionary phase. It's a process. Socialism isn't just a thing that you accomplish. It's a process you have to go through. And, and so whether that class struggle remains on the level of actual capitalists and proletarians still existing, or whether that happens in the sphere of the superstructure with bourgeois ideas, that class struggle is still going to continue. Um, and because it's that process away from capitalism, it necessarily becomes intensified. You know, you, you, we, we can debate that. We, we can talk about that. But that was an idea in Mao's head. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say before I move on to the actual cultural revolution itself is that Mao was really wary of a, of a big ossified bureaucracy of privileged, comfortable party members. He didn't want one to develop in China as he had seen it develop in the Soviet Union in his mind. He felt that this would undermine the continued development of the revolution if party officials became disconnected from the masses and became comfortable and invested in their own positions inside the party. So Mao was really serious about making that not happen. He didn't want um, just a big bureaucracy kind of commanding from on high. And so the Cultural Revolution was literally unleash unleashing the masses on that bureaucracy itself. And so w when we're going forward, the last thing I'll say is that you really have to think about this as experimentation. I mean, if, if you believe that the social that socialism is a science and that it develops through trial and error and that just like in the hard sciences, there are experiments and some experiments fail, some succeed, but the good scientist takes both the failures and the successes, learns from them and incorporates them in their next attempt. That is what we should think of when we think about the, the cultural revolution. It was a gamble. It was it was not it was not a perfect, pristine thing. There were plenty of failures and mistakes. I mean, when you put that much confidence and power into the hands of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, it's not going to be some nice, tidy, you know, perfect little packaged thing. And so I think we should think about it through the interpretive lens of an experimentation in the socialist science. Um, but I as... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I like that idea a lot of... Um... It as a science experiment. I mean, there is that quote from Mao about a revolution's not a dinner party. Like, yep. like and it's, it's messy. Um, we're we're trying to build society here. It, it's great, and I don't know a lot of you know. I haven't studied intensely the proletarian revolution, but uh, I did read a book by Charles Bettelheim, who is a phenomenal writer that you know wrote in the sixties and seventies, um, and he wrote a book on the cultural revolution and industrial production in China, where he went to China and interviewed uh, dozens of workers mm -hmm. and factory, uh, factory supervisors and cadres and all this kind of stuff and, and wrote about the organization of China under, uh, under Mao and under the, the cultural revolution. And the, the things that, like the optimism, it, it's like heartbreaking, really. The mm -hmm. optimism of the of these people um, was so high, and Ugh. the scope of it was massive. Like the idea that, I mean, again, if you're talking about like a the ideal way to structure a socialist revolution, you know, this is it, really, for, coming from Mao. Mm -hmm. But but the scope of it was so massive, and just. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'll just say impossible. Like, it, it was too much. It was, he wanted to create something that was great, and and he did. Um, but ultimately, like, trying to coordinate millions of people, like, leading from the bottom up was just, was too ambitious of a product uh, project in, in 19, you know, 60s. Yeah, I think that's that's important and interesting, and and that's that's exactly right. Mao believed in both top down structure and bottom up at the same time, and so you know that makes him a pretty unique figure um, in in socialist history because he actually had the historical stage through which to conduct those experiments. And so I you know that's that's really important. You know, 
as people know, I'm, I'm pretty sentimental myself. I mean, those accusations, I can't deny. Um, I get teary eyed. <laughs> I get teary eyed quite a bit. I mean, the injustice of the world constantly brings me to tears. I feel like I have tears in my eyes every single day. But, you know, watching these documentaries, especially like during the the Red Guards flooding Tiananmen Square in the millions. I mean, people holding huge red flags flooding into Tiananmen Square where, you know, Chairman Mao was was getting ready to to launch the Cultural Revolution. And, and hearing the, the firsthand accounts, which some documentaries, which from the 80s are still able to you know interview firsthand subjects. I mean, truly, truly powerful people. People truly felt like they even say it in their own words. We were liberated. We were told that we can we can take the revolution to the next stage, that it's in our hands, especially young people, students, people with not a lot of power. And so I think that's a for all the mistakes and, and failures, and there were plenty of successes as well, but for all of the, the complexity of it, I mean, it, it was truly a beautiful, overwhelming, and as you said, impossibly large movement. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it just powerful. And so that... But, that- Oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, that kind of ties in with what something I wanted to ask. Um, as yeah. as you're c- jumping into uh, the Cultural Revolution here, like, um, what was the? Uh, could you talk a little bit about the popular conception or attitude towards Mao himself? Yeah. So that conception. I mean, from the from the revolution of 49 itself, the fights against the nationalists and against Japanese imperialists, Mao was a really, really, you know, venerated soldier. And, and, and he was well respected for that, for all of his sacrifices throughout the, the revolution itself. And then for his leadership role, people fucking loved Mao. Like it wasn't like, you know, this idea that Mao and it's so orientalist and disgusting yeah. how the West, how the West paints these million, hundreds of millions of people as if they're all just brain, like the same thing they do with the DPRK yeah. as if they're all just brainwashed yeah. automatons. It's, it's infantilizing. Yeah, it's if you listen, these fun. people, there's firsthand accounts of these people talking and they're like, shut the fuck up. Like I fu- <laughs> we fucking loved Mao. Like what, what he did for us. And like the lifespan of the average Chinese person doubled yeah. during Mao's years, people that never had education and healthcare in their lives for, for centuries, finally got in these rural areas. I mean, people really loved him. And even which will We'll touch on later the factional infighting during the most intense and bloody periods of the Cultural Revolution. Everybody always, always said we are we are Mao's true supporters, right? So nobody ever talked shit on Mao. Nobody disgraced him. Everybody's positions were always sort of justified by referencing to Mao. And so, I mean, he was truly, truly loved by the people and not in a brainwashed way, but in a sincere way because he dedicated his fucking life to this shit, you know? So just touching really quickly, and please like don't hesitate to to jump in and stop me anytime. Well, that's what we do best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do more of it. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to to check up with the Great Leap Forward and the Senio Soviet split because, as was mentioned, these things are really important. But after the Great Leap Forward, you know, after the the tragic um, sort of you know failures of of that policy project. Mao kind of resigned as president and was and replaced himself or, or the party replaced him with I'm going to always butcher these names. So go easy on me. But it's <laughs> it's Lu Shao Chi. Um, yeah, so, I think that's I think that's pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. I mean, I was listening to documentaries trying my hardest to not fuck this up too bad. but uh, I'm terrible with names like that. But yeah, so he, so he was kind of after the Great Leap Forward, Mao took a step back and he let Lu Xiaoqi take over and he really studied Chinese classics and he studied political economy. So for this, for about six, seven years between the end of the Great Leap Forward and the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, Mao was really dedicating himself to, to studying and kind of being out of the spotlight. But he was still, he was still the chairman of the party, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. But there's like these these titles, like president, more right. or less. Yeah. So yeah. yeah so yeah. he he was that position. Then he dropped out of it and let Shao Chi take over. And and he kind of fell to the background a little bit. Although always he had the hearts and minds of the people, and he was the you know quote unquote supreme leader. Um, but but during this time, as he was studying. Mao felt that you know the more moderate leaders were, were kind of moving back towards capitalist restoration. He saw what happened with Khrushchev in the Soviet Union, and he didn't want it to happen again, and so or didn't want it to happen in China. 
And so the Sino-Soviet split, as was mentioned, was an important part of this, too, because after Nikita Khrushchev took over for Stalin, he denounced Stalin and implemented a bunch of economic reforms. Mao did not like this shit at all. Mao, Mao saw this as revisionism, and he feared that the Soviet Union would fall to capitalism. Relations soured between the two governments. Mao started off just, like, kind of indirectly uh, denouncing revisionism and then just turned it into full-blown den denunciations of Khrushchev himself. And the, the Communist Party of China would publish polemics against uh, the Soviet Union. So that's all that's all in the background. So there's a like there's a interesting quote that happens early on after Stalin dies. And um, Mikoyan was the foreign minister at the time under Khrushchev. And mm -hmm. he goes to China for their one of their uh, party meetings. And <clears throat> the secretary of China. Uh, defense their war secretary I, I don't remember the name right now but he comes up to mccoyan and he says you know why is it now after only after stalin has died that you choose to say these things about him you know kind of being like you know we know you're lying basically mm -hmm. and mccoyan says uh, well we dare not do it while stalin was in power we feared for our lives and the minister, he responds, what communist is it that fears death? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you fucking can't fear death. I've wrestled with my own fear of my own mortality, and I feel like communism, or me becoming a communist, has sort of like lent my, my individual ego to a bigger project. And so death is less of a problem for me than it was in my early 20s or late teens, which is interesting. Um, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've noticed that too. That's never about, that? It's not really about self-preservation anymore. Yeah, it, it's, it's simul, it simultaneously like gives you something to live for and something to die for. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, definitely. It gives your life meaning. <laughs> I'll be, I mean, I guess I'll be a... Uh... Not quite dissenting voice. I'm still scared of uh, death in terms of, like, physical pain and, like, non-existence. However, um, I do a lot of volunteer work with a hospice and stuff. And so, like, it gives me a lot of – for me, communism and my whole political project is a means of, like, giving people um, the time and the energy and the resources to actually, like, deal with their existence and, the more, more like, grapple with the concept of mortality as opposed to mm. – not being able to focus on those things because you always have to fucking work um, right. and you don't have the energy to think about um, like what's important in your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's important. I mean, you know, I had like um, literally an existential crisis about, probably like four years ago where I, I literally became so depressed and so obsessed with death that every single day for about three months of my life was just focused on it. And I would like, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into it, but I was very, very scared. And I came out that other end and I had this huge new surge of empathy for other people. And that's when I really started dedicating myself to the communist cause um, to liberate people from all forms of oppression and suffering. And I really felt like this dark period of my life. I came out the other end as like a, a better human. I feared death less and I, I became ultimately like super inspired to uh to just fucking go full full blast ahead to help other people and i also draw like strength from people like marx and and, and even che who who face their death with such extreme courage i mean i think like marx on his deathbed he was asked like do you have any last words to say before you die because he everybody knew he was gonna die and he's like last words are for fools who haven't said enough in their life <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then as, as Che was being killed, you know, the gun was pointed to him, and his executioner had to get super drunk um, because the executioner was more scared than Che, and, you know, Che had the famous line where he's like, shoot, coward, you're only going to kill a man. And, you know, those things give me inspiration to this day. Yeah, fists um, raised. <laughs> for sure. But I want to I read a quote jumping into the, the Cultural Revolution because it was a time of upheaval and the times leading up to the Cultural Revolution, they were kind of like, things were getting certainly like better, you know? Um, and so a lot of people wondered, 
like why was this necessary, etc. And and all these quotes I'm going to be reading today are from a great book, which I encourage anybody to go check out. It's by Han Suin. It's called Wind in the Tower, and it covers the Chinese Revolution from 1949 all the way up until Mao's death. Really, really. We'll also be in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. You you can't like get better than this. It's it's so great. But the quote says. If everything was proceeding so well, then why was the upheaval necessary? In 1972 and 1973, one still heard it said aloud in China, was it really necessary to do it this way? For the Cultural Revolution had to pay its cost in errors, in extremism, and in destruction. The answer is a question of class outlook, of ultimate goals. The choice was either an unexplained palace coup, removing Lu Xiaoqi, imposing Mao's line from above, or the way which Mao chose, which was to rouse the totality of the people in order to let them, through revolutionary practice, grasp the great issues at stake. Had the problem of Chinese revisionism been settled by a dictate from Mao, the people, and especially the younger generation, would never have realized the ups and downs, the torment and conflict, the torturousness and complexity of revolution. It had to be a revolution within the Chinese revolution, and in fact, it amounted to a civil war. Only this could shock the party and the people into an understanding of the continuing revolution, of the danger of assuming that all problems would be solved once the Communist Party took power, of the danger of docility and submission to orders from above without using one's own head, of what it really means to be a revolutionary. So I think that's a powerful opening to the Cultural Revolution. So having said that, let's go ahead and, and dive in. Nice. So the early days of the Cultural Revolution, this is May 16th, 1966, a notification summarized Mao's justification for the Cultural Rev. Um, they started putting out, um, you know, articles in the People's Daily, the, the, the Communist Party's uh, media outlet, talking about internal enemies who, quote, wave the red flag to oppose the red flag. And one of the quotes from one of these, like, this is, this is basically Mao and the party ramping up and justifying and laying the intellectual and cultural groundwork for the, the cultural revolution that's to come. The quote from, from that is, quote, those representatives of the bourgeoisie who have sneaked into the party, the government, the army, and various spheres of culture are a bunch of counter-revolutionary revisionists. Once conditions are ripe, they will seize political power and turn the dictatorship of the proletariat into a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Some of them we have already seen through, others we have not. Some are still trusted by us and are being trained as our successors, persons like Khrushchev, for example, who are still nestling beside us, end quote. <laughs> So this is like him, you know, working up the, the people's like, you know, passion and stuff. And and one of the first things that Mao did, which is I really encourage people to go look at uh, Google video of this because it's in color because it was in the late 60s. Fucking fascinating. Mao led a huge and beautifully organized swim across the Yangtze River in 1966 at the age of 72. To, he, he led it and it was like organized and synchronized it was amazing he did this to I can't swim at 34 <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? it's amazing I, I just fucking love the pictures of Mal like swimming on his back and shit <laughs> well that was so like a that did, they, did he have floaties <laughs> no, no, hell no this motherfucker was like no like <laughs> swimming was like a huge like he was really into it and that I think didn't that become like a regular thing until he died yeah I mean I think I think that was his main source of physical activity yeah it was swimming he was great at it yeah but he, he led this huge charge against one of the biggest rivers in the world through it to inspire the revolutionary forces in China and also to demonstrate that he was physically and mentally ready for this next stage of revolution. This was in the summer of 1966. Um, letters from what would become the Red Guard started pouring in, representatives. They were inquiring about this new outburst of rebellions after all these polemics and pieces in the, in the People's Daily. And Mao responded with to one of these with the famous slogan, bombard the headquarters so <laughs> Lu and Lu and Deng Xiaoping they were they were representatives of the, the more moderate wing and they were called capitalist rotors at this time they were demoted from like second and third positions to like sixth and eighth positions and Lin Biao was promoted to the party's number two spot Lin Biao was a general in the People's Liberation Army and Mao promoted him while he demoted the moderates and then the entire bureaucracy, the, 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 the government agencies themselves started to become de-bureaucratized with big agencies being tossed out, being dramatically decreased or eliminated altogether. So this, this, this uh, de-bureaucratizing started happening right away. 
And then the uh, 16 points were released. Now, this was released on August 8th, 1966. It was released by the party's central committee, and it basically announced explicitly for the first time the need for a cultural revolution, which it defined as, quote, a great revolution that touches people to their very souls and constitutes a deeper and more extensive stage in the development of the socialist revolution in our country. And the... The, the longer the longer quote here, I, I, I'm going to sprinkle in quotes because I think they're important because they come from the party itself at this time. And yeah, so I really do it. Yeah. yeah, I find it illustrative. Um, it says, quote, although the bourgeoisie has been overthrown, it is still trying to use the old ideas, cultures, customs and habits of the exploiting classes to corrupt the masses, capture their minds and stage a comeback. The proletariat must do just the opposite. It must meet head on every challenge of the bourgeoisie to change the outlook of society. Currently, our objective is to struggle against and crush those people in authority who are taking the capitalist road, to criticize and repudiate the reactionary bourgeois academic authorities and the ideology of the bourgeoisie and all other exploiting classes, and to transform education, literature, and art, and all other parts of the superstructure that do not correspond to the socialist economic base, so as to facilitate the consolidation and development of the socialist system. So, I mean, you, you can't make it any more clear what, he, what he's doing here and what the, what the party's getting ready to do. You can say what you want about Mao, but, like, he never didn't go hard, like, <laughs> towards, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly, like, towards, like, revolution and Marxism. <laughs> oh, for sure. And then he was, and like I said, he spent these years preceding this, studying Marx, studying political economy, studying Lenin. So he was, he was very ready for this shit. Um, and, and like I said, he, he really advocated for verbal struggle. He didn't want this shit to turn violent. Um, but he had so much confidence in the masses that he went ahead anyway, and we'll see that it, it ultimately did in, turn violent. So I mentioned earlier the uh, Tiananmen Square rallies. This was between August and November of 1966, and this was about eight mass rallies in Tiananmen Square with over 12 million Chinese communists coming from all over the country to join. And the state, the government, paid for Red Guards to come from every corner of the country into the capital and flood these flood the Tiananmen Square. So this is about eight rallies over two or three months. It's really, really fascinating. And again, go look at these images. I mean, this is proletarian power of the utmost, most inspirational, most massive demonstrations, perhaps in world history. I mean, this is really some, some amazing shit. Um, and, and Mao, you know, he put on the Red Guard um, armband the first, for the first time himself. And he, he, you know, him and Lin Biao sort of told the crowd about what the Cultural Revolution was and, and what their job was, was to be. And um, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, was in, put in charge of housing and feeding the Red Guards. And so I'm going to read from the book again about the Red Guards. I think this is really kind of fascinating and beautiful. Um, at the, the book reads... At any time, two million of them, Red Guards, would be in the capital. The People's Liberation Army, in charge of arrangements for feeding and lodging them with the help of the local population, surpassed itself, providing 6,000 trucks, drilling the young in, in March time, latrine discipline, erecting canteens and dormitories. Everyone praised the quote-unquote little generals, whose conduct was excellent, who sang the world belongs to us, and who were very clean, well-behaved, and polite. As the cold set in, however, epidemics were feared, especially among the light-clad Southerners. In October, the Red Guards were enjoined to stop coming by train, but to come on foot, as transport was being disrupted by their huge numbers. They began their own long marches, walking from places as far as Sinkang, Manchuria, and Tibet to organize great link-ups and exchange revolutionary experience with other Red Guards. Millions of them saw their land with its people of many ethnic origins for the very first time. This enormous cavalcade through China was very well absorbed, and no Red Guard went hungry or without a bed. To pinpoint the few cases of bad conduct is to ignore the discipline and good example of the great majority of these youngsters. They left no dirt behind them. They did not steal anything, end quote. Never had China been so exuberant, so alive, so full of the sound of drums and cymbals, and so colorful with red flags everywhere. 
The Red Guards were not allowed to carry weapons, nor to arrest or try anyone, nor to arbitrarily replace any administrative cadre. They were to criticize and repudiate, combat the four olds, proselytize the masses, arouse them into a climate of total involvement. And this they did, spreading into every corner of every city and every town, taking down old street names, pointing out how much feudalism still existed. Some of their actions were naive and some were even brutal, especially when they began to conduct house searches among former capitalists, landlords, and counter-revolutionaries refugeed in the cities. But out of 30 million young people, it would be unbelievable not to have a percentage of delinquents. The Red Guards performed a task no one else could have. They literally spring-cleaned the cities, turning up caches of gold and firearms and ferreting out many a secret agent and spy. <laughs> I just, I fucking love this shit. <laughs> It makes that's you. It makes wild. you want to wave the little red book. <laughs> that is that. That is just wild to me. It's so I mean, wild. And, and, and the thought yeah, of. Ahead. I mean, the thought of millions and millions of people like all descending into the into the city at this point. Like that's just that's such a crazy thought. Like like every every socialist country, especially like immediately after their revolution, had you know a, a phase like this, but mm-hmm. like the scale is. It's yeah. impressive. It's. I don't, know. I don't know that I actually have a word for it. <laughs> it's baffling. Yeah, I mean it's mind blowing. Like I said, it, it's uh, it's tragically mind blowing. Yeah, it's it's world historical, and yeah, yeah. And I, I'll I'll never stop drawing inspiration from from yeah, the images. Yeah, I mean it was it's remarkable. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I mentioned the destruction of the four olds, and the four olds were customs, culture, habits, and ideas. And the idea here was. You know, these traditional bourgeois or even ancient concepts are holding people's minds back. And so we should go and confront these things. Now, you know, Mao had in mind, like I said, a repudiation, a, a denunciation, going into to cities and sort of struggling with people, bringing up the, the, the fallacies and some of these old ideas, etc. But, I mean, it did, it did turn violent. Museums were ransacked. And, you know, old cultural artifacts were destroyed. There was an excess of, of popular fervor, which, you know, it, I mean, it can be understood, especially when you have tens of millions of people all over the country acting with basically pure autonomy. I mean, they right. didn't really, they, they were told the basics of what to do, but they had the power in their own hands to go out and do what they did. And so as, as, the, as the quote mentioned, there were plenty of excesses and brutalities, but there was also lots of education and, and lots of class consciousness raising in the minds of, of a younger generation, which the Red Guards were mostly made up of. Um, so they took direct action. Like I said, old Confucian cemeteries were desecrated. Religious buildings and imageries, especially Buddhist ones, were destroyed. Confucian relics were attacked, etc. Um, people were encouraged to criti- criticize cultural institutions and to question their parents and teachers, which, you know, in a, in a traditional Chinese culture, this notion that you can question your elders was, was very, very new. And um, to, to be able to open that up and to say, you know, you are, you're, it's right to rebel, it's right to criticize young people, you have just as much of a right to speak your mind as the older people do, and you should. It's simultaneously liberating as, as it is scary, you know, especially for these older folks. It's still very new. I mean, I lived in Korea in the late 90s, and it, it, it still exists there, the... Um, idea that you cannot question those that are older than you i mean and i'm talking about like i said in the late 90s and i mean you still would never if you did you're talking about huge uh, you know you're offending them in a huge way mm-hmm. yeah so i, I mean, can't imagine yeah. what it was like in you know in china in the 60s ago. Yeah. yeah exactly exactly and, and another thing they attacked was also I mean, correctly, symbols of Western imperialism and including Western diplomats. And there's some video footage of Red Guards just fucking swamping and surrounding like British fucking diplomats and shit. It was <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Um, did, did they did they kill him? I'm not sure about the exact death tolls. In, in fact, um, a lot of these death tolls during the Cultural Revolution are really hard to come by. The good records weren't kept. Right. And, you know, the estimates range from a couple hundred thousand all the way up to about two million. 
people died. And of course, these numbers are not only exaggerated in the, in the bourgeois histories and, and media, but they're also solely laid at the feet of Mao, as if Mao was the one going and, and doing this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these, these are people acting autonomously. And as we'll see, a lot of infighting and factionalizing occurred, which, which Mao didn't foresee, and he was... He was kind of pissed at. I mean, he didn't like he didn't like where some of this shit went. And and I'll talk about how uh, I'll read some quotes from the book again in a little bit about how Mao, like, you know, spoke out against it and even sometimes called some of the actions petty bourgeois and it really, super interesting. And there's some anarchist elements, too, which we'll touch on in a second. But that was a lot of 1966. And I'm focusing on 66 through 68 because these were like prime hot times for the cultural revolution. This is when a lot of the shit happened. And, and so, you know, the bulk of this, we're about halfway through the bulk of this happened in those, in those years. Um, so moving on to 1967, this is when the factionalizing started. I mean, the Red Guards went into all these towns, a lot of workers, a lot of peasants, they were mobilized and, and they, they took to the streets as well, which is beautiful. But also this this created factionalizing. Um, Red Guard organizations began splitting off from other Red Guards who they disagreed with on strategy or messaging and started fighting each other in the streets. In April of 1967, at Mao's request, there was an attempt by his fourth wife, Jian Qing, to better organize Red Guard organizations and kind of try to convince them to stop all unhealthy activity. This was <laughs> this was impossible because these local groups lacked centralized leadership. I mean, even in one, I heard of one factory having up to eighty-five factions represented inside the factory itself. Oh my god! So this factioning was was crazy. And it soon became unclear which groups were truly dedicated to the revolution and which ones formed opportunistically to use chaos for their own gain, looting, etc. A lot of the attacks on authority figures and elites in the party um, spawned these these rebel groups or these other factions that took up the mantle of Red Guard that, that said that we're, we're fighting for Mao, but they were the sons and daughters and family and supporters of the elites in the party who started attacking the Red Guards. And then... So that's kind of like a right wing deviation, right? And then there's a left wing deviation where, you know, basically anarchist elements started appearing, anarchist factions, which said like, you know, all party is bad. All political leaders are shit. We need to do complete bottom up, no top down anymore. So um, I'm going to read it. No gods, no masters, no chairman. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. Uh, So I'm going to read a little quote from here. No rules, no bedtimes. (laughs) Yeah, because I find it fascinating. It says... Thus, the ultra-left promoted by Lin Biao was objectively right-wing and counter-revolutionary since it was sabotaging the cultural revolution to bring about their personal power of one man. Now, this was in light of the Lin Bao incident. So she was writing after Lin Bao had been exposed as a traitor, and we'll get to that later. Okay. So some of these some of these attacks on Lin Biao were, you have to understand them like post hoc. You know, she was looking back after the Lin Bao incident, which we'll talk about in a second. But basically she goes on, both it and the Liao right wing were were keeping violence at a high level, which Mao did not like. Organizing and arming landlords and rich peasants, inciting workers into rival factions, deluding the young into demolishing all party committees and all party members, destroying the party itself. This anarchism was expressed by the student Kuo Ta Fu, now, now an ultra leftist who said, quote, all the party is bad, all must be destroyed, end quote. There must be, Kuo said, general elections by the masses to assure the real dictatorship of the proletariat. An editorial in the People's Daily on January 22 added to the intoxication, calling on its readers to seize power, seize power, seize power, establish a new proletarian order, without any reference to the party cadres or to party leadership. Yet Mao had made it clear that without the participation and leadership of party cadres, the Cultural Revolution could not succeed. And he also said that 95% of cadres race are good or relatively good so you have this influx of ultra leftism you know Um, oh yeah you also have this really interesting thing and I'll touch on this maybe later we can talk about it in the final wrap up but this idea that you know, um, c- communist China was just dictated from Mao on high. And no, there are all these factions and even the People's Daily, as I just read, the the piece, the, the paper that emanates out of the Communist Party itself had ultra left and, and rightist deviations articles being propped up in it. So it was not one man rule and everybody followed orders. There were infinite factions, infinite positions, you know, that were allowed to flourish and combat each other, even through the official party media itself. 
So this idea that it was this brutal suppression of free speech and that only, you know, one line was able to to articulate itself is just utter rubbish. This was a very intense, you know, factional time for, for China. Well, and yeah, it's interesting because like it's a really common idea that there was um, this cult of personality, quote unquote, around Mao. And like and I mean, it, I think it still, it still sounds like definitely there was like widespread adulation and respect for this guy. But like still it wasn't um, Mao directing yeah, directing everything that was happening in China. Like he was, he was there and had opinions about um, how things should go. But then, yeah, it, it sounds like there were just all these other factions and like all this other. Yeah, so it's just it's a really people just have a really myopic view of like this period. I think on top of like the the general criticism of communism as being a one party system, it is a joke because it's like saying that you know, which is true, but <laughs> it's like saying that in America we have a one-party system because, sure, we have the Republicans and the Democrats and the Libertarians and the Sock Dems, but guess what? They're all capitalist parties. So right. <laughs> if you if you want to look at it like that, then, you know, okay, sure. It, you know, then communi- in these communist countries like the Soviet Union or in Mao's China, there was a one-party system. Right. Just like there's a one-party system in the United States of America. But that does not mean that there was not debate within that party. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and this and this idea that free speech was was stifled is absurd when even the the app the media apparatus the mouthpiece of the party itself had you know com- combating ideas and and factions represented in its own articles and in fact under the communist party of china there were eight non-communist parties explicitly non-communist parties called the popular front and they existed under the broader communist party of china's umbrella and they existed precisely to give non-communist forces a platform in china's society allowed and protected by the bigger communist party so, I mean, dissent was everywhere. People disagreed in the streets. People disagreed through the media outlets. People disagreed and, and talked about their disagreements in the party itself publicly. This was this was a very complex time and everybody had their say. So just something to keep in mind. I mean, we all know bourgeois propaganda is utter bullshit, but <laughs> it's just an, another layer of that here. So that was 1967. It was really marked by infighting factionalizing chaos. And this is where a lot of people died because I mean, this was in in many cities, this was straight up civil war. People were, you know, they went from more rudimentary weapons like rocks and and slingshots and shit to full on arms and, you know, military, uh, military um, barracks were raided by factions and militaries in, in different localities would give their loyalty to certain factions over others. I mean, it was, it was really, really chaotic. And so in 1968 through 1969, this is kind of the period where, where Mao reasserts control. The Red Guard factions were actually dismantled as Mao feared that these movements were growing totally out of control and they were doing far more damage than good at this point. The People's Liberation Army was sent in to many universities and schools where the Red Guards kind of, you know, were concentrated because they were, they were younger students. Um, the, the military was sent in to kind of like, OK, guys, enough is enough. We're, we're reestablishing order here. The purpose of the Red Guards in Mao's mind was was kind of fulfilled, and Mao and his radical comrades had deossified the bureaucracy. They kicked out or demoted the capitalist rotors within the party, and they sort of reestablished the the socialist path. And, and so they felt comfortable enough to say enough of of the Red Guard shit. Um, and and one of the big ways that Mao did this, which I think was was brilliant, um, was that he began the down to the countryside movement. And this is this was a movement that sent young people think red guards here sent red guards from the city into the rural countryside to experience what life was like for the peasants. The idea was to send them to the country to stop the chaos and the social disruption that they created in the cities, educate them on peasant life. So it was one way, right? So the peasants would educate the Red Guards, but also it was the other way because the Red Guards would go into these rural communities and they would spread the revolutionary ideology to these rural areas as they were being taught by the peasants. And this transition uh, sort of smoothly out of the intensity of the of the factional infighting in every cities after it had accomplished its goals. Now, 
the factionalizing went on in some far flung regions, but the, the party was stabilized and the, the capital was stabilized. And this movement really, you know, helped educate the peasantry as well as the young students on what it was. So the final quotation I'm going to read out of this book was Mao's reflection on these two years of really intense cultural revolutionary violence. Mao Zedong disapproved of the dunce capping and the parading. To point up his disapproval, Mao would invite to stand with him on the rostrum at the 17th anniversary celebration of the PRC on October 1st, several of the people that were treated this way. One of them was an eminent woman doctor who had shown great fortitude and went right back to work after being paraded. Paraded and dunce camping were, were mechanisms by which, you know, the Red Guards, like, shamed and denounced people publicly. Like, would they literally, like, have the... Pointy dunce caps. Literally, yeah, literally. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they dunce cap motherfuckers. I thought you were speaking metaphorically. That's amazing. no, yeah. They put dunce camps on them and paraded them through the town. That's super funny. So, what was what was the official purpose of the Red Guards? Because it, it sounds like it became just more educational. Like what? Or like initially, what were they for? The, the Red Guards were the were the the main unit by which the Cultural Revolution was carried out. Right? They were the ones that flooded Tiananmen Square, and their their mission was to go to every city and town and you know combat the four olds carry out strategy or struggle sessions sort of you know raise the revolutionary ire of the people get them mobilized and you know they go into factories and get the the workers mobilized against their their bosses i mean there's still capitalist remnants in the economy as well as in the superstructure and so the red guard's job was to go out there and sort of combat that you know um so i'm going to Continue, continue, continue on to this paragraph. A great grandmother, she is well known and respected, uh, a well known and respected figure of China's post cultural revolution society. At an October meeting at the Politburo, Mao said he was surprised by the havoc created. Never had he expected that all China would be thrown into such turmoil. Since it was he who had caused this turmoil, it was understandable to him if some felt bitter towards him. Perhaps Mao had not expected so much anarchism from the young, especially from the university educated, but this. This only proved how deficient the previous education had been in instilling true proletarian values and conduct. The youth had been brought up in an elitist framework, and despite all the slogans, what had emerged was petty bourgeois radicalism, not the real proletarian spirit. For the latter does not use violence when it's not necessary, it protects collective property, it is not self-seeking, it is disciplined and innovative. Pseudo-radicalism had deluded many, Mao would say. It would, it would slow down the pace of the cultural revolution. But the mainstream of the movement had done what no rectification movement, no socialist education movement had been capable of doing. It revealed the dark side of the party in an all around way and from below. And that is what Mao wanted. Mao added that it would take years before anyone, including himself, would really understand the cultural revolution in its entirety. So that is Mao after these intense two years sort of reflecting on it. And he was so honest and open, even willing to take criticism himself for some of the failures and excesses and even absurdities um, of the cultural revolution. And and that's, that's really interesting. Um, that quote you just said, because it's, um, it almost sounds like a, like a criticism of like adventurism, quote unquote, or whatever. Right. Um, just sort of like radicalism for the sake of like being radical. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, it is kind of a critique of the the cathartic street protest for its own sake. Yeah, um, the, the the lack of discipline. You know, uh, I, I found that really fascinating, and that's why I bookmarked that to read it because I'm like, wow. I mean, Mao Mao is reflecting on this and criticizing himself and criticizing his own movement, and then he admits at the end, which is which is crucial that. The legacy of the Cultural Revolution, he could not grasp it in his time, and nobody could. And only now, I mean, after we have we can look back with, with yeah. hindsight, can we really do the work of sort of understanding the pros and cons yeah. of what was created? Well, I mean, I mean, we've, we've joked on the podcast several times about, like, uh, and it's, it's kind of a joke amongst leftist circles, um, like, oh, self-crit, self-criticism. But, like, like, Mao was the, like, OG self, self-criticism guy, so, like... Exactly. Yeah. So what what did the original like self crit session look like? How did that? What were the dynamics? <laughs> it's funny because I mean it start like you know Mao's idea was you you go to people of authority that aren't that aren't revolutionary or that you feel are capitalist rotors and you struggle with them being like a literally a, a public situation where red guards would stand behind you drag you up on the podium criticize you publicly and a- allow you to to self crit. 
and <laughs> basically say what you feel you've done wrong and how you're going to fix it going forward. So it was a way of, of people holding other people accountable. Um, but it, as I remember yeah. it from reading about about it from Bettelheim, they actually sent them letters first to allow them to criticize privately before they would drag them into public to criticize them. Sure. Yeah, some of them did. But because it was such a big movement, that wasn't always the case. I mean, and, and some some devolved into straight violence. I mean, like uh, Liao Shao Chi, for example, one of the moderates in the party, he was he was like brutally beaten and imprisoned. And he actually died in, in a jail cell during the Cultural Revolution, um, you know, alone and totally broken down. So there, there, like, there were some like pretty fucking excessive like shit that went on. And even like teachers, like, because you have to think these not only is this like young people, but it goes so low as like middle schoolers and high schoolers. So these people had, you know, a lot of, of power all of a sudden and they turned against their teachers, many of their teachers who we're like good people and like really loyal to Mao, but this shit got out of hand. And so like teachers and people that were otherwise really good revolutionaries and veterans of the, of the, of the revolutionary struggle in the first place were beaten or, or, or killed by these people. And, and that was really what made Mao be like, okay, enough is a fuck enough. Like this shit is getting out of control. He started a fire then it got out of control. Yeah. Like as a, as a high school teacher, that's uh, that's terrifying. <laughs> Oh, and that's kind of the struggle of like the top down versus bottom up. I mean, and that's such a, a crazy balance to try to strike. It is. And that's dialectics. Why you think, you know. Yeah. And that, and that's why I always talk about this. It's an experiment. It's this grand experiment. And, and, you know, in, in the socialist project, these experiments need to be conducted. And, and Mao was really trying to find creative solutions to really, really difficult problems. And so I think he can be forgiven for some of his, you know, blindness about how these things would, would play out. I mean, you, you can't put that shit solely at the feet of Mao. In my right. right. Yeah. So what, what is your opinion on uh, the current self crit culture, typically on social media with people just yelling at other people with different ideologies to self crit without giving any more like emphasis on what they're doing wrong or anything like that? Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of shit. I mean a lot of the a lot of the self crit stuff now weirdly comes out of like liberal um, identity reductionists and and those types who don't really want to educate you. They just want to sort of like degrade you publicly, and so it's like you need to self crit, etc. Um, so I don't really know what to say about that exactly, but I do want to point out. Um, this weird parallel between the Red Guards then and the Red Guards as we know them today in the U.S. There's actually, like, for whatever your criticism of the Red Guards, and, and they're plentiful, they, they they really are, in the best and worst ways, a continuation of the Red Guards of the Cultural Revolution. It sounds like yeah. it. <laughs> all, all of the excesses and absurdity of the original Red Guards carried to this fervor and this sort of, like, everybody's an enemy except us that sort of that sort of tradition still like weirdly lives on in the red guard so like they they're true to their fucking name <laughs> for good or bad i don't know what 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 are your guys thoughts on that i mean so i i i mean yeah obviously the the kind of like the red like our current american like red guards like in austin or whatever have sort of become a sort of a punchline um on for like the the left the American contemporary American left a little bit but it sounds um and 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 it's obviously different because our our red guards I mean I guess I guess I have to claim them because we're all on the same side ostensibly um like I guess I guess uh it's different because they don't have the same um institutional backing or like mm. like, like party backing or I guess not party backing but like somebody like the leader of the revolution they don't have like the backing of that cuz we don't have a revolution so it's 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 interesting like following some of the bottom up tendencies with um the most kind of like base uh like appeal to like proletarian values and like fighting degeneracy and like revisionism and all this stuff without a kind of uh well it's a yeah, w without a, rev a revolutionary backing, I guess. Does that yeah, make sense? It's, it's kind of done in an ideological 180s to where, like, every... Like, like the Red Guard's initial purpose was to protect the revolution and protect uh, the revolutionary ideologies. But now, it in um, especially liberal circles, and it's more of a 
a tool used to prevent any sort of revolutionary ideologies from even being discussed at all. Mm. Yeah, there is a dogmatism associated with it. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, not having the party backing, not having the context and the discipline of a larger party structure that can that can rein you in when you get a little too out of control. I think that that does play a role. I mean, I'm not saying that they're that they're all bad. I mean, I think the, the jury. No, and I wasn't trying to say out. that either. Yeah, of course. The jury's still out on, on what, what role they will play um, as these leftist forces in the U.S. sort of build on themselves and, and gain momentum. I'm, I'm very curious to see how they go, but I, I, do, I do truly believe that when you look at the original Red Guards and you see the Red Guards of today, there is an interesting parallel and like a, a principled mirroring there that they're, they're very much carrying on that legacy for better and for worse, in my but opinion. But I think, I think the difference between like trying to hold your ruling party's feet to the fire is very different than trying to undermine that of a revolutionary struggle that at this point is infantile. Right. True. Or I guess, I guess I should say in its infant stages. Right. Yeah. It's, it's that, just that, like, that's true. It's just like you were saying with like the, uh, um, socialist project and the experiments that go along with it. We are currently just, bombarded with a ton of like infantile revolutionary socialist experiments within the u.s and and there's been i mean very limited of those in the past and not anywhere near in uh, uh the material conditions that we exist in today so it's it's really interesting and and it's in a lot of ways we really are starting from the very bottom of yeah you know of the revolutionary process definitely yeah it's super it's super interesting to see how it's playing out in the american context specifically um so yeah so i guess all i have to say here is i'm just gonna wrap it up with a couple like probably like a five to ten minute wrapping up because that was only through 68 which are the main years Uh, if you guys don't mind I i can go forward here and then at the end um, I could talk about the successes and then we can just talk about like kind of reflect on it and any points we want to make before we wrap up. Is that cool? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in 1969 of April, there was the ninth party Congress. Now this is after Mao research control sort sends the red guards down to the countryside to learn from the peasants. Things are beginning to stabilize, et cetera, et cetera. The, the bureaucracy's been de bureaucratized, et cetera. So there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a, <laughs> I love that phrase. Yeah, I know it's, it's a mouthful. Um, but there's a restructuring of the party at the ninth, the ninth party Congress. This is like the official reformation of the party after that process had already taken place after the upheaval of the cultural revolution, etc. cetera. Um, Lin Biao was officially announced at, at the ninth party Congress as the party's number two figure and written into the party's constitution as Mao's closest comrade and successor. So when Mao was going to die, it would be Lin Biao that would take over. And that was now officially written into the constitution. The party has become more radical and has institutionalized the leftism that Mao represented, although not the ultra leftism, which we should bear in mind, that he represented after having had its moderate and right wing elements confronted and not like eradicated because, you know, some of those moderates were just demoted inside the party. So they they still existed. They still had power. And towards the end of his life, Mao would reach out to some of them and bring them back as he saw that some of them had contributions still to, to make towards the towards the revolution so you know it wasn't like all these people were killed although Liao Shaoqi did die um, you know Deng Xiaoping didn't uh, Zhu uh, and Li didn't so th- they'll come back and, and they'll make their their um, appearances made a little bit later but it, Mao went about restoring some of the party institutions that had been destroyed by the cultural revolution that were still needed etc factional fighting as I mentioned did remain sort of on the on the peripheries but new factions within the party itself started arising, right? So you had Lin Biao, who was a general in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the military. So he, he rose to power through this. But you also had Mao's fourth wife, Jian Qing, who would later go on to form the, the Gang of Four. So, you know, his wife, Jian Qing, represented the radical political camp. Lin Biao represented the military camp. And Deng Xiaoping... And Zhao and Li represented the sort of moderate economic camp. So those were just three, some of the big factions involved inside the party itself. And now this was a, go ahead. Oh, didn't Lin, didn't Lin Biao and his, uh, his group, didn't they try to assassinate Mao? Yeah. So that's exactly what I'm about to, yeah, that's what I'm getting okay, into right now, cool. which is, I mean, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about this at all until I was researching this. Um, so this was, this is fucking 
interesting and weird as shit. And I'm not even like people don't even really still know what to fully make of this. A lot of this is hearsay. There's yeah. a there's a lot of concrete evidence on this, but. So basically, those factions had formed. Lin Biao's prestige grew. There were tensions with the Soviet Union at this time. There's actually skirmishes on the border between China and, and the Soviet Union, and, and it was a possibility that war w- would happen. So this led the military wing, led by, led by Lin Biao, to sort of take greater and greater roles within the party as the people were ramping up for the possibility of war with the Soviet Union, which, my God, it would have been a fucking horror show. That would have been horrible. Yeah. That would have been the worst thing ever. This, I mean, I'm so glad that that did not happen that would have been a tragedy like, that would have that would have changed i mean obviously it would change the world but like i don't think we can like comprehend how much that would have changed the world oh man it would have been terrible um luckily that didn't happen but it did it did catapult lynn inside the party and so there was the, the the coup attempt is called the the project 571 and like i said there's lots of vague shit or surrounding this but this was in you know the the 1970s 1971 lynn B, lynn supporters whether his family or his his political base in the military people sometimes think that lynn himself may not have been fully behind the the coup but there was a coup to oust Mao and not only oust him, but to fucking assassinate him. And there were plans to use the air force. Cause this was the military faction to bomb targets and ultimately take out Mao. But this plot was uncovered. And so Lin Biao, his wife, his son, and his core supporters jumped on a plane and fled to the Soviet Union. But on route to the Soviet Union over Mongolia, the plane crashed killing all of them. Huh. So this happened, I mean, fucking quick. And it totally caught Mao off guard. It caught the party off guard. Mao became fucking, I mean, Lin was like Mao's, one of his best friends, you know, Lin, Lin was uh, like even, you know, his number two guy, literally he's supposed to take over after Mao died and Mao was getting up there in years. So Mao became like depressed and reclusive. He had no answers. He didn't know what to make of this incident. He didn't know how to frame it for the Chinese people. Mao's overall health was in decline. And Mao started reaching out to former party members um, who had been purged or denounced in the Cultural Revolution, like Deng Xiaoping, to sort of come back in and act as a stabilizing arm to suppress any remnants of, of Lin Biao's supporters in the military, and also to act as a counterbalance to the Gang of Four, led by his fourth wife, Jiang Qing, who was this radical, like, as I said earlier, the radical political camp. Um, so with Mao's health declining, there was no succession plan ready. Members of the radical Maoist camp, the Gang of Four, created a political formation, and they were all about sort of kicking out Deng Xiaoping and the more moderate wing. They, they basically wanted to continue the most violent, upheaval parts of the Cultural Revolution. Hmm. Mao, Mao saw Deng like, favorably, and even like Wind in the Tower, this book written by Han Suen, um, there was still at a period when Maoist looked on Deng Xiaoping in a positive light and Mao saw Deng in a positive light. And he saw Deng as somebody who could shore up the economic management of the country because he feared that if the gang of four totally won that, um, you know, they were politically important as far as their radical revolutionary continuation went, but they weren't very economically competent. And Mao was really worried not only about the legacy of the Cultural Revolution, but he fucking cared deeply about the future of China. He didn't want to see the economy collapse under under poor leadership. Um, so, you know, as he was as he was basically sort of seeing his way out as the 70s progressed these new factions, this dialectical tension, these contradictions blossomed in the party. And Mao at the age of, I think it was his, his, in his eighties in 1976, you know, he, he fucking passed away and the rest is history. Everything beyond that is, you know, far outstrips the scope of, of this debate. But right. basically the gang of four was arrested and tried Deng Xiaoping took over, started implementing economic reforms. A big schism between MLs and MLMs still occur to this day over the trajectory that, that China took, etc. But that was the Cultural Revolution, <laughs> as, as convoluted and complex <laughs> as it is. <laughs> and it's, it's that you just saying that it, it really brings up how. I, so, I mean, in so many different um, socialist states, when you've got like the the main revolutionary leader when that person dies like then there's always like weird stuff that happens i mean it happened in uh 
I mean, obviously, after the death of Stalin, everything kind of got weird. Um, it happened in Yugoslavia. I mean, we can talk. That's complicated. But, like, um, I mean, Cuba. I mean, Raul Cuba, did okay yeah. for a couple of years, but now they're talking Venezuela. about... Venezuela. Yeah, Venezuela. Um, yeah, yeah like all one. these different places. Like it's so it's just it's just really interesting to think about. Like how do we how do we fight that? Though? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I yeah I don't know. That's that's something we need to figure out. <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> like, is it is it a matter of um, giving like per, uh, progressively more power to the successor um, under that revolutionary leader, and then uh, un- until that you know that successor is able to act with you know, the relatively the same decision and or decisions and decision making capability that the leader uh, before them makes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it may, difficult. Maybe, maybe like a, a progressive transition rather than like a sudden transfer. Sure, and I think you saw that with Fidel and Raul. That was kind of a, a, a smoother transition than other ones. Um, but I also think like what Mao and, and maybe even Hugo Chavez tried to do was really put agency in the people's hands so that they became less dependent on who the leader was, raise the class consciousness of the people, give them revolutionary responsibility, and hope that that will be enough to carry through whatever chaos the, the, you know, the, the next administration may bring with them. I mean, ideally, you want a smooth contingency plan, sure. but here, here you see just chaos reigning. You see that the, by, by the time Mao died, there were still so many unsolved questions and so many possible directions that China could take that it almost escaped the the capacity of, of one man or one leader to make those decisions and, and plan for everything, you know? Yeah. I mean, in the same, the same happened in the Soviet Union. I mean, um, you know, Stalin, his, his successor, what would have been his successor was Zhdanov and he died in 48 and late in 48. And after he died, there was nobody else to really pick up the mantle. And, you know, in, in a, you know, obviously this is the early 50s, not the 70s. So the idea, again, we have, have to look at it from the dialectical perspective. The, the idea of like the, the you know, bottom up structure certainly didn't exist in the Soviet Union. It probably wasn't possible in the Soviet Union in the late 40s after World War II. Um, but in... In his death, it left a huge vacuum in the leadership of the Soviet Union, which mm. then, of course, would lead to like the shit show that would happen after Stalin's death. Right. Would would yeah. terms be like an effective solution? Because this isn't like just specifically a problem to uh, socialist countries. <clears throat> I mean, we've seen this all throughout history, um, it's like especially prominent in like the Mongolian Empire and the Roman Empire. Where you have you know that one that one major leader that's holding everything together falls, and then nobody really knows what to do. So, the, but the problem with term limits is that you place this emphasis on elect <clears throat> electability, and when you are pla- like when your when your ideological platform is based on electability, you get stuck in bourgeois politics. That's where we're at right now. They're just one long term. Um, <laughs> I, I I mean I think this is kind of. Uh... I think this is kind of getting away from the sure, sure. conversation here. <laughs> but so what I want I wanted to bring it back um, and ask like ask the question to you, Brett, to um, kind of summarize here. So like you mentioned it earlier, and to me that's one of the big take one of my big takeaways was the importance of um, the superstructure in the socialist revolution as well as the base. Like, what are your big like? What do you think as contemporary socialists and Marxists? Um, what do you think? we can learn like what are the big things we should learn from the cultural revolution in china well i think the best way to do that is to talk about some of the successes that that they had um in the cultural revolution so like the the radical policies of the cultural revolution provided many in rural communities with i'm I'm gonna get to your question in a second but i'm just talking about the successes before we move on oh yeah Um, yeah oh absolutely yeah so the radical policies of the Cultural Revolution provided many in rural communities with middle school education for the first time, which is thought to have facilitated the rural economic development later in the 70s and 80s. Similarly, a large number of health personnel were deployed to the countryside as barefoot doctors during the Cultural Revolution. And that that's he- such a fucking cool yeah. story. I mean, like, it's Amazing. we don't have time to get into it, but, like, that's such a cool thing, that specific um, concept. 
Yeah, it is. And it's, it's beautiful. And that was the first time a lot of people in those areas had consistent health care. Some farmers were given informal medical training and health care centers were established in these communities, these rural communities. This process led to a marked improvement in the health and life expectancy of the general population. And as I said, when Mao took over, the average lifespan was around 35 or 40. And when, when Mao died, the average lifespan of the average Chinese citizen was up to 65 years. So that is, that is a wow. doubling of life expectancy during the Mao years um, all the failures and mistakes included I mean that still is a huge fucking gain sure the proportion sure. of Chinese children who had completed primary education increased from less than half before the cultural revolution to almost all of them after the revolution and those who completed junior middle school rose from 15 percent to over two-thirds the educational opportunities for rural children expanded considerably art and theater took on explicitly revolutionary and proletarian forms during the cultural revolution leveraging the arts themselves as a revolutionary vehicle and finally or second to finally modernization of the chinese culture <laughs> second to finally. <laughs> I, I could talk forever um it modernized the chinese culture it brought into question superstition religious dogmatism and other remnants of, of ancient chinese culture which held back the minds and imaginations of many chinese people and then the final thing from an mlm perspective but i think even mls can largely get on board with this is that this represented a theoretical advancement via experimentation in as i've said many times in the socialist project um th this represented a, a new attempt to try to to revolutionize the social or the superstructure um you're quite what well, can you rephrase your question for me real quick uh well so i just asked um as as contemporary like in the year of our lord 2018 like as <laughs> contemporary socialists and marxists like what can we take away or what should we take away from um what happened in the years of the the cultural revolution I think the People's Republic of China. I think we can take away a few things. One, I think it's crucial that we realize that that a revolution cannot simply be fully commandist, fully top down. It can't simply be fully bottom up with no structure, no coherency, no five year, ten year. 20 year plan, right? There has to be some sort of way that we take the best of both and incorporate them into it. But then the other thing is that. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it is very important that revolutionizing the economic base of society is not enough. That there are these, you know, if, if we take the base superstructure analysis seriously, even if you change the base, the superstructure lags behind. And if that superstructure is full of reactionary, or especially in the U.S., white supremacist, colonialist, imperialist ideas about the world, that's going to affect how much you can do with the base. And so these two things need to happen um, together And so what a cultural revolution would look like the next chance we get to launch one. Hopefully we'll learn from the failures and the mistakes that occurred in this one. But hopefully we can also take this idea seriously that, that a revolution needs to happen in the superstructure and that we have to be creative with how we're going to launch the next one or how we're going to conduct the next one because I think it really is a crucial part of any future revolutionary project. Uh, so I guess uh, my other question would be... Um... So it's I mean it's kind of a a silly hypothetical and like take it as seriously as you'd like or not but like so what what do you think could have been done differently um like what what like if you, if you were Mao what would you <laughs> <laughs> no like like is there a way do you think there was a way to do I and I mean obviously this is so specific and so culturally um contextual and so like we won't like this is just in the broadest sense. Like, do you think that there was a way in China from your reading to kind of uh, still defeat the four olds um, without the kind of the weird excesses? Yeah, that's a, I mean, very challenging just because of the size of the country. Right. I mean, and the right. amount of people involved. But I think in retrospect, one thing, and I would, I would fucking love so much to hear to sit down with Mao and ask him like in retrospect, <laughs> like what would you have changed or what would you have done differently? But, but perhaps more organizational structure, right? Like sending out party cadres to cities, starting there, having like formal training for the red guards, because a lot of the naivete, the belligerence, the sort of, um, ignorance of these of these young younger kids led to a lot of the excesses and absurdities of the cultural revolution. So yeah. perhaps a more organized, um, slower like launching 
could have been a way like with actual members of the communist party going in having formal training sessions with red guards and kind of building up that that power that way and then directing them with a more concrete set of directives cuz a big part of the problem was that you know Lin Biao and Mao were just like were, were telling people to go do these things but not really giving them a roadmap and and on one hand it speaks to Mao's complete confidence in people i mean he he truly believed in the masses but yeah, on the right. other on the other hand it does show a sort of short-sightedness about you know where these things could lead so maybe i just i just would say more organizational structure coherency and training before it was launched might have been one way to sort of blunt the edges on some of the more extreme excesses in my so. readings about like the cultural revolution one of the things that was super like intriguing to me that i always wanted to like ask you know in this case would be Bettelheim, but the people that he interviewed they talked about during the cultural revolution how not only was there this gigantic economic uh, restructuring but that they would go home to their families and they would discuss like revolutionary structure at home as well mm. and like i would just love to know how do you you know how do you motivate if i could talk to mal you know as we're, as we're talking <laughs> hypotheticals if i could talk to mal i would love to say you know how do you motivate you know, this, these masses of people to literally go home to their families and discuss revolutionary structure at home. I mean, that seems like a, an insurmountable task. Oh yeah. I mean, I can't, especially even... when you consider the scale, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can't even imagine that. I mean, and that, that's one of, that is one of the beautiful things is that, you know, these people really did f feel empowered. They really did feel like they were liberated and they were able to have these conversations and, you know, socialism and the socialist project, the, the revolution itself has to be all encompassing. It, it is a, it is a total sort of overturning of, of centuries and millennia of oppression and brutalities by capitalists and imperialists. So it has to be at the, around the dinner table. It has to be in the school buildings. It has to be on the factory floor. It has to be at the highest reaches of the state. It has to, it has to like, you know, go through every level of society. And that responsibility is, is on everyone's shoulders. It's not just, you know, a, a government's problem. It's, it's all of our problems. And creatively thinking through these solutions and having those conversations is essential. But I really do think that that, 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 that speaks to people's real feeling of autonomy and, and, and people really picking up the burden of, of what it means to continue the socialist revolution and taking that, that responsibility seriously. It, I don't have the answer to the question, but it's you know, <laughs> more questions so respond. I, well, what good I, are you uh, then? <laughs> I have one, one more question for you. So um, what, uh, when, when you consider the infancy, infancy of um, revolutionary polit Marxist politics in the U.S. right now, what would you like to see applied um, to that? that we have learned from the cultural revolution in China. Well, I think I think what we're going to apply from the cultural revolution is going to come downstream. I think what absolutely needs to happen now and I would fucking love to see it happen and in fact, I'm working, I mean, I think all of us are sort of putting our weight behind this idea of the Marxist center, which is this idea of trying to build a big Marxist party in this country, a, a party that is national that, that has funding, that is disciplined, that is militant, that, that can, you know, that it abides to some basic, where MLs and MLNs and Marxists of all stripes can kind of all come into the party, all be representative, have these, have these discussions, but I fucking know that we need a party. We need a big national organization to get things moving to where the questions of the cultural revolution can actually be imminent and applicable, because what the cultural revolution is, is something that already happens after the base, the productive forces are revolutionized so it's this it's this extra stage in the revolution and we're not even close basically we have to build the party we have to have i mean i'm, I'm thinking like a marxist party it can't be too hyper sectarian i do not think like a specifically ml party that that you know rejects all other forms of marxist is is a viable option but i also don't think a big ass tent that allows every fucking asshole with an idea in is also the answer it has to be principled real talk it has yeah. to be principled. It has to be Marxist. Dialectics right here. Exactly. But, I mean, I so, think that's the first step. How, so, how you, that so, you hear it here oh. so you heard it here first. DSA bad, but also PSL bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I was about to ask. Like, so what, like, what would be the differentiation between like, Marxist Center and, and those parties, and why is, is that good? Uh, well, I think that it would, it would basically be 
it's weird because I, I want to walk this line between being not hyper sectarian, not like one, one specific tendency like PSL is, but also not being wide the fuck open like DSA is. So something that is principled, that is Marxist. Or you have a sheriff in, like running one of your chapters. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> well, I think like um, even like a, a Marxist party with caucuses that represent different Marxist outlooks, like an MLM caucus, an ML caucus, but a, a comradely principled organization where we can all have our disputes and our talk but that we can build together towards something that can get us to the point where we can have the talk about what the fuck it means to launch a cultural revolution in real life. Cool. All right, so we do have to wrap up. Um, Brett, do you have any last ideas or statements that you wanted to make? I don't. I love what you guys are doing with the podcast. Um, I'm really happy to be on. I know we're going to meet up in real life um, in late November to work on this Marxist Center thing, and we can have a, an, a uh, in real life episode where we can do a dual release or something. I want to keep collaborating with you guys. Keep up the great work. I really learn a lot from your guys' podcast. I'm not even blowing smoke up your ass. Like, I really, really. <laughs> <laughs> I really it's okay enjoy if you are. Show. We understand. Especially Ethan's ass if you don't know anything in this group. <laughs> well, uh, you guys I don't are know about that, great. but. You guys are great, and I really appreciate you guys having me on. It's it's really an honor. Brad, thanks for coming on. That was, uh, and thanks for, like, being so uh well spoken and like research that's awesome yeah absolutely so yeah thank you so much again brett um for anybody who hasn't already checked out his uh podcast you should definitely do so it's rev left radio um oh and and the guillotine i forgot about that guillotine yeah it's i always guillotine. pronounce this wrong <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't you didn't you talk Only about like brett the calls it the guillotine <laughs> Well, yeah, oh, wait, does Brett... Oh, is, no. Yes, is it like a Midwestern thing? I don't know. No, it's, it's fucking not. I just, I, in the early days, I called it the guillotine, and I got just ransacked and mocked and humiliated. <laughs> <laughs> I basically got dragged into a struggle session over my pronunciation of the word. Yeah, it, it's weird. I'll say quesadilla, but then I'll say guillotine. I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah, the guillotine and Rev Left Radio are, are my two podcasts, and you know, go check them out if you're interested. They're on all uh, major... Uh, podcast apps where fine sources, podcasts are yeah. sold that's right <laughs> that's right cool. all right and thank you so much to everyone listening yeah. please don't forget to rate and review on your favorite podcast app wherever fine podcasts are sold um for all three of our podcasts uh like us on facebook uh on at facebook.com slash prolspod and follow us on twitter at prolspod if you have any feedback or topic ideas feel free to send us an email at proles of the round table at protonmail.com red salute <laughs>
microphones up, bandana across the face, dog. Oh, Always, dog. Whatever you say, dog. Rifle to the sky, bandana across I'll the face. I'll be the words that drama over and over for every soldier with a go run slung over his left and right shoulder. Got the pull and triple K slang. Make change with the school books or the bang bang gang bang. Gather up the troops all on the block. Put bullet holes in the White House and connect the dots. We don't need those cops. We need the hood on lock. We need the murders of our people by our people to stop. We need our money to recycle, keep the neighborhood rich. We need to monitor the education end of our kids. We need the money to be evenly distributed out. We need Ann Cotier to shut a motherfucking mouth. Zapatista guerrilla as soon as the beat play. My rifle's a little scrappy, it's my I can't take pay. Indigenous spear chucking on mine. My spear X these white boys out like Kevin Federline. Just one at a time. Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of...